Hi there, my name is Beth Gibbs and I'm going to tell you about my yoga journey. And it started six months after the birth of my son, way back in 1968. I was on maternity leave and I was feeling really overwhelmed by being a new mom and all the responsibilities that it entails. So I started looking for help in one of my favorite places, a brick and mortar bookstore. So I scoured the self-help sections and I picked up a book by the late Richard Hittleman. I took it home and started to practice yoga on my own in true introvert fashion. I think the name of the book was the Richard Hittleman's 30 day yoga practice. And I was curious, um, I, so I did research because that's kind of what I do. And a little bit of research let me know that most of the classes in my area were filled with white folks, mostly white women. And having grown up in New England in a small town and having spent most of my life as the one grain of pepper in a sea of salt, I was not interested in taking a class. That is, until one summer on vacation on Martha's Vineyard, my sister friend encouraged me to try a class. I was astonished. I said, girl, you, you do yoga? Well, she did. So I was surprised, but I tagged along with her to the class. And um, of course, we were the only two grains of pepper in a sea of salt, but it was enough for me. I was hooked on the group energy. So when I went home, I found a class that fit my schedule. And even though I was still oh, the only grain of pepper in a sea of salt, I got over that pretty quickly. And only illness or family emergency was going to keep me away from my yoga classes. A few years later, I discovered integrative yoga therapy because my <clears throat> yoga teacher in town started encouraging me to teach. And I didn't understand that, but I thought I like new things. So why not? So I liked the philosophy of IYT. I signed up. I took the training and I began teaching. And I was the only grain of pepper in a sea of salt but it didn't matter because of what I was learning. So a few years after that, I was invited to join the faculty and to my surprise, there were a few other grains of pepper in that sea of salt, so I was very happy. Now I have over 20, that was in like around the mid 1900s. So now I have over 20 years of experience teaching and mentoring hundreds of yoga students, teachers, yoga therapists and training from all over the world to implement what I learned from IYT, the five layer model of self-awareness, the koshas. Um, and happily, I have watched the benefits of yoga over the years sift down into the black community. It's been a joy. Black teachers, male and female are out there. Students are beginning to flock to yoga classes. All of my classes at the present time are diverse and inclusive and of all ages. And it's been a joy to watch this happen over the past 20, 30 years. And we even have an organization now, the Black Yoga Teachers Alliance. So yoga has come full to our communities. We do need to do a little more reaching out to encourage more people to take advantage of the benefits of yoga, especially stress reduction, because you know, being Black in America has been is and probably will continue to be a very stressful situation. So I, like most folks, black, white, or other, came to yoga for the movement, the exercise, the relaxation, and the stress reduction. It, it took a while for me to get to the deeper aspects of yoga, you know, those aspects that help you live life with a measure of clarity, contentment, and resilience off the mat. And for me, that aspect was and continues to be the Panchamaya Kosha model, or what I call the five layers of self-awareness for simplicity. Now, during the early years of my yoga training, my understanding of the Koshas was superficial. I mean, I heard what my teachers said, and I was like, okay, that makes kind of sense mentally. I could talk about it. And I could read about it from the manual, but it took months before I could embody it in my life and before I could embody it in my teaching. 
I found over the years that the koshas are a useful tool because they enable us to see both the what and the why of our reality. In other words, to see life as it is, not hidden behind a veil of wishful thinking or denial. Because when that happens, we can consciously choose to make changes we need in our life. We can choose to remain unchanged with full awareness of the consequences of our non-action. Or we can find acceptance and peace of mind if change is not possible, because sometimes it simply is not. Now, most of us are familiar with the Western mind-body model of health that kind of popped into Western consciousness and awareness in the early 1900s, because it says that there's an interrelationship be what, between what goes on in your head, in your mind, in your brain, and what happens in your body. So that's mind-body. That's kind of a what I think of as a two-layer model. But the koshas with a five-layer model give us a broader foundation for self-exploration because they propose that these five layers of being are important for us to understand and work with for optimal health and healing. And that's different from being fixed because being fixed is one thing, but people can be fixed with a from a health condition and still not be healed. And people can be healed from something that's really tearing them up inside and may be terminal, but not get fixed. So that's what I mean when I say optimal health and healing. So just briefly, here are the, what those five layers are. Layer one, physical. This is your body and your environment. It's you, your size, shape, gender identification, race, ethnicity, anatomy, physiology, home, and the planet that we all share. That's kind of in the headlines right now. Second layer, that's energetic. These, this is our breath, how we breathe, and our energy levels, and the energy that runs through our body to allow us to navigate life, live, work, and love. So the oxygen you breathe nourishes the body and the brain and sustains life. And that energy, that's that invisible life force that enables us to do all those things we need to do to, to live our lives. And that can be very subtle until we kind of tune into it. So I usually tell people one of the first things you might want to do is just kind of figure out at what points of the day you feel really energetic and up and at what points of the day you kind of feel poopy and want to take a rest. That can kind of get you into this whole sense of what the energy is. <clears throat> three, layer three is mental. These are your thoughts, your beliefs, your emotions. It's how you think, what you think about, what you believe, and how you experience and express your emotions. And then the fourth layer, to me, this is probably one of the most important. It's intuitive wisdom, or what we call the witness. And that's the ability to observe all of our layers and our life with compassion and without judgment in order to consciously make or not a more conscious or informed choice. <clears throat> and the, the picture, the mental picture I use to help people understand this is a Venn diagram. You take two circles and they interlap maybe about 40, maybe 30 to 40%. So in your mind, you can have a feeling that I'm not good enough and it can, you believe it is true. And because you believe it is true, you might act in self-sabotaging ways. However, the witness part of you, the intuitive wisdom, it sees this. It knows that it is not true. It can identify where you got this idea. And it begins to sort of try to push the awareness of that in that area of the two circles where they overlap. And if the mind finally gets it, it's like, oh, okay, now I know why I feel this way. Now I can make a choice to deal with this situation. So to me, that's a very important layer. And then the fifth layer is bliss. This is your connection to something larger than yourself. And it can be spiritual, it can be religious, it can be a deep connection to a healthy passion or to the natural world. You know, what happens when you're 
out in beautiful nature and you see something that just inspires awe. That's kind of what I mean by, by bliss. So why is this important? Because no matter size, shape, color, condition, or position in life, when we were born, our five layers came into the world with us, and therefore they are accessible to us 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, if we choose to tune into them. Um, and, and in my pursuit to learn as much as I could about this, because the, the yoga, the journals that we had in our trainings, they, they described it, but it wasn't enough for me to help me embody it. So I looked for books on this model. And I found a couple of pamphlets, which didn't help, but I found a book, just one book by the late BKS Iyengar. And it was titled Light on Life, The Journey to Yoga, Wholeness, Inner Peace, and Ultimate Freedom. It's written in the traditional philosophy and terminology of yoga. Lots of Sanskrit, lots of philosophy. But I wanted a book that presented the five layers, the koshas, in a contemporary, practical format so I could share that with my students. So I decided to write one. <laughs> so now my book, it took three years, but in, it's called Enlighten Up, Finding Clarity, Contentment, and Resilience in a Complicated World. And it was released last month. And my hope is that it takes readers on a down-to-earth, often humorous, nine-step journey through five layers of self-awareness to gain that clarity, contentment, and resilience in a world which, as we know, is very complicated right now. And I also hope that it can help students in yoga training programs to embody that model in their cells much faster than I was able to. And the fact that Joseph LePage, founder of Integrative Yoga Therapy, wrote the foreword for the book, Icing on My Yoga Cake. So it's always an uh, helpful to have an example or two to show how this model works to guide one through a situation. So I'm going to share one that I had to work through. I had an emergency hysterectomy. And that was bad enough. But afterwards, I was experiencing chronic pain in my low back and my right hip. So when I began to explore my physical layer, I noticed that the pain tended to flare up when I was feeling stressed. So I saw an integrative positional, yoga, integrated positional therapist who was also a yoga teacher. And he gave me a reason for the pain. He said that my pelvis, and I didn't know this, he said, your pelvis is chronically misaligned in three ways. It's rotated, one hip is functionally higher than the other, and you have a deep lumbar curve. Okay, next I saw an orthopedic specialist and I got an additional diagnosis of, I hope I pronounced this right, spondylolisthesis. So now I knew why my hip and low back were handy targets for stress to manifest physically. Then I wondered if there were second and third layer issues to deal with, you know, breath, energy, mind, emotions. There were. I was anxious at that time, irritable, stressed out, exhausted, and unhappy with my job, my second marriage, and the length of my self-imposed to-do list. So I then had to call on my fourth layer, my intuitive wisdom, the witness, to trace my stress mess to its source. And I realized that stress, irritation, and the pain occurred in situations that left me feeling blocked, stuck, and trapped. Digging deeper, because you can always dig deeper, underneath I found fear. The fear of being powerless to control what I found myself facing. Because I'm a recovering perfectionist. Control is very important. But I'm in recovery. That situation could arise as could be as simple as sitting in stalled traffic or as complicated as navigating a difficult relationship. So then I thought, could I unearth some unhelpful thought, emotion, or belief that was feeding this fear, sucking my energy, and keeping me stuck, blocked, and trapped? Well, yes, I could. I finally traced it back to a fear of calling attention to myself embarrassing myself in public, being rude, 
or making a scene. And I recognize that as a lamentable hangover from my good girl training as a black woman raised to be, and I know a lot of you have heard this, a credit to the race. Well, that was a blissful wake up call because now that I understood the energetic connection between feeling stuck, my physical pain and its emotional source, I was able to make and continue to be able to make one of three conscious choices in any situation. I can change the situation. If I can't change the situation, I can change my response to the situation. And if I can't do any of those, hopefully I can find a way to leave. If that's impossible, then the only thing left is acceptance and figuring out how to deal with it. So um, often when I talk about this, folks ask me to say, okay, you're taking us on a nine step journey through the five layers of self-awareness. So what are these nine steps? So each of the nine steps, and I'm just gonna go through them quickly, provides a way to approach self-awareness layer by layer. So in terms of your physical body and environment, the advice is become aware. Learn to pay attention to your physical body, how it moves and how it feels when you move. Pay attention to your personal environment. Do what you can to help the planet. Layer two, breath and energy. Basically become aware of how you breathe when you're stressed out and when you're feeling wonderful and your energy states during the day or listening to how energy moves through your body, which you can do when you pay attention. Layer three, mind and emotions. You begin to identify your thoughts and your feelings. You, you need to understand that thoughts and feelings are very different. Sometimes you ask people, well, what are you feeling? And they'll respond with, well, I think mm -mm, they're different. So as you begin to learn to do that, you begin to observe and label them. And then you start exploring your beliefs. Where did they come from? How are they manifesting? Then we move to the witness, the other half of that uh, Venn diagram circle. We learn to turn the mind back on itself to uncover the source and the intention of our beliefs. And we do that through two main ways, conscious relaxation as in yoga nidra, shavasana and meditation. And then we take what we've learned and we choose skillful action based on any new awareness. And then for bliss, that's step seven, eight, and nine, we understand, you need to understand what brings you joy in life. And then you work to uncover and soften any unhelpful attachments or desire to control the outcomes of your actions. I like to use the word manage. I don't like to say that meditation helps you control your mind um, or practicing yoga helps you control what happens. That just doesn't ring well for me. I like to use the word manage what happens, happens, happens. And these values in your life, no matter what happens on the outcome. So the basic message that I would offer in terms of working with this uh, five layers of self-awareness, it's contained in a quote by, and I hope I pronounce his name right, Jawaharlal Nehru. And it sums up the core message of this whole thing. Quote, life is like a game of cards. The hand that is dealt you represents determinism. The way you play it, it's your own will. So becoming truly self-aware at all of your five levers, levels or layers is how you play your game of cards. It's the foundation you need to build a balanced life and find that clarity, contentment, and resilience in our complicated world, which looks like it's going to be pretty complicated for a while longer. And however complicated it is for the majority, for Black folks, that complication is doubled. So it's really important that we begin to deal with that. And this whole thing starts, as I said before, with self-awareness and the ability to make more conscious choices. So now I'm going to kind of morph into a quick little practice that will hopefully give you some advice on how to manage difficult situations and help you cultivate your ability to make those conscious choices. And I've used the national dis international distress signal, SOS. But what I mean by SOS 
is not save our ship. It is stop, observe, select. And because I love quotes, I'm gonna start with this quote from Rumi, who said, you know, he's that, that um, Persian poet that, that people love to quote because he was so wise. So this quote goes, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I'm wise, so I'm changing myself. Now, because there's nothing new under the sun, it's no surprise that we have a 21st century version of Rumi's wisdom from a modern day African American woman, Dr. Annie Elizabeth Bessie Delaney, who said this in 1995 at the age of 104. She says, quote, I thought I could change the world. It took me a hundred years to figure out I can't change the world. I can only change Bessie. And honey, that ain't easy either. Okay, so very wise. So to conclude, I'm just going to read a little bit from this um, SOS practice from my book. And <clears throat> it's a quality to, quality to help us um, embody self-discipline. Um, so when you find yourself stumped by a stumbling block, observe, stop and observe before you act. Then select a choice that fits your highest intention, or you can give in to the impulse inertia or habitual behavior with full awareness of the consequences. First step, stop. How do you do that? Tune into the feelings and sensations in your body, breath, and energy, and ask yourself the following types of questions. And if you're watching, please feel free to close your eyes. I'm just going to take you through a quick little guided thing here. Physical body, how is this situation, issue, or problem you're facing manifesting itself in your body? Do you feel tightness, tension, or pain anywhere? Are your fists or jaw clenched? Are you frowning? Does your back hurt? Are you smiling? Is your mouth watering, especially around food-related impulses? Just sense and feel. Layer two, breath energy. Checking out your breathing. Is your breathing full and deep? Is it shallow or stuck in your chest or throat? Do you feel any energy sensations like tingling, warmth, heaviness, lightness, or coolness? Are you feeling energized, tired, or fatigued? Blocked, stuck, or held back? Observe, now witness the mind and the emotions. How accurately and clearly have you assessed your situation? Have you thought through the consequences? How will consequences affect you? How might they affect others? Can you handle the consequences? Is there a habit or belief that might be influencing your choice? Are you feeling caught up in the drama? Are you judging yourself? Do you have enough information to move forward? Should you take action now or give it more reflection? Select, choosing skillful action. Just allow your choices to form in your mind. Consider them all and consciously choose one that fits your highest intention. Alternatively, you can choose to give in to your impulse, inertia, or habitual behavior. If you choose to give in, you'll need to be aware of the consequences and your ability and willingness to deal with them. When you apply SOS to choices that you make every day, occasionally, or once or twice in a lifetime, you are gradually changing yourself in ways that help you live with clarity, contentment, and resilience. And even when it's hard, cultivating conscious choice is worth doing. Remember Rumi's words, today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. And Dr. Bessie's words, honey, that ain't easy either. So if your eyes are closed, please open them. And I'm just going to conclude with a mudra that um, is said to bring balance and integration to all five layers. So you take your four fingers and your thumb, which equal five, let the fingers touch, let the thumbs touch, space between the hands that oh, looks like you're maybe holding an orange and relax your hands in your lap. 
sit with your spine comfortably straight and take three to five nice, long, deep breaths over the next several seconds. And then after your next exhalation, just inhale, raising your arms up overhead. And then as you exhale, let your arms float down and make a wish for yourself, your best intention. Next time you breathe in, arms go out, up and overhead. And this time as you exhale, since you have taken care of yourself, send this wish out to someone else that you care about and see them at their very best. And then third breath. Together, arms out, up, and overhead, bringing hands together, palms together overhead. And as you lower your hands to your heart, send this wish out to the entire planet. Perhaps seeing our world become a little more uncomplicated, peaceful, and productive. And the next time you breathe in, lift the heart. And as you exhale, the eyes open. Namaste. And thank you for your attention.